If you don't have someone, don't worry. We're all gonna die from climate change. Frankie! Don't say that! Hi, I'm Pamela, and that's Frankie from my show, Better Things. Frankie is the living, breathing personification of all of our climate change anxieties. You can see sustainability uh, in front of the camera and behind the scenes of my show, Better Things. Like my water bottle, it goes with me everywhere. We've had Hi. a lot of guests bring a lot of things to the show, but no one's ever brought their own jug of water before. No, uh, I just, it's my hydro flask, and it's driving me crazy that everybody carries plastic bottles everywhere, so I just bring my water. Did you not think we would have a glass of water for you? No, I knew you would, but it's just like an extra added, like, oh, yeah, I have one at home. So anyway, <laughs> annoying little thing. I see, I, do. I see. So just the act of carrying a water bottle made a really big difference. Others see it and think, hey, maybe I should be doing that too. I mean, they do after I usually get in their face. But, uh, the thing is film sets, TV sets, recording studios are so infuriatingly wasteful and it was shocking to me how many producers, executives, studio managers didn't even try. Don't know what's going on or they don't care. So I have no plastic water bottles on, on the set of better things at all at the start of each season. I uh, gift my crew reusable water bottles. Everybody's gonna be getting a bottle. These are the new bottles. Anyway, we try to be plastic free. Isn't that cool? There's just no excuse not to carry a water bottle. People don't feel like anything is missing because it isn't. So, okay, this was all before COVID-19. Now, we all have to drastically reshape film and television sets and recording studio practices. And that part is not a bad thing. We were going too fast. It wasn't sustainable. And right here is a huge opportunity to rethink all our practices. So when I hear about programs like this, I get so filled up with relief. Really hopeful and grateful that you young people give two shits. Don't worry, teenagers are gonna fix the world. I mean, three teens have already figured out how to break down styrofoam. And now there are machines that can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. Oh, thank God. Next up, you have a workshop on sustainable storytelling and how to integrate environmental justice into stories and minimize writer's room waste. How are you gonna keep writers from snacking? I don't know. How do you keep them from putting their hand in the bowl with all the same snack? Good luck, you guys. I love you. Peace. Welcome, everybody. How are we doing? Fine, thanks. Fantastic. Great, thank you. Good. And I want to let the audience know, for those that are watching, uh, you can chime in with your thoughts throughout the panel. Uh, please don't hesitate. You can comment on the Facebook Live or tweet. Uh, and the hashtag is HDCSstory. That's HDCSstory. That's two S's. Don't mess it up. Um, so let's dive in because I, I want to hear from all of you, different backgrounds, different lifestyles. I want to get this conversation started by saying that in my history of watching film and television, sci-fi has become and has been one of the main genres discussing the environment in storytelling. And I'm curious, is that an effective way to go about it? And I want to open the floor up to anyone that wants it. Uh, I, I think, I, I, you know, I think sci-fi is a great way to kind of attack social problems like that, big social problems like that, because you're building a whole world with a whole bunch of different set of rules so you can decide what you want to focus on and how you want to build it from the ground up to, to be about particular things. Um, it makes it a lot easier. It's also a lot simpler and easier to get your head around a problem when it's, uh, you know, in that environment. It makes it seem a lot simpler than it is in our world. Do you think it might take people out of it, though? I mean, if they're seeing sci-fi, I mean, what do you what do you think, Bonnie? Uh, I don't think it takes people, I mean, people watch films to be taken out of their situation. I think what's good about playing with genre is that you can talk about quite difficult subjects. I mean, when you look at the environment and the justice and injustice around um, how damaged the environment and people are becoming, it's a really difficult subject to talk about. Whereas if you use a genre like sci-fi, there's a kind of element of escapism as the filmmaker, because you have this kind of space to play in that you kind of don't maybe get 
told off so easily when you're kind of looking into documentary filmmaking and things like that, I think. So I think there's actually more freedom in it. Okay, well, how, how can we make sci-fi and these stories be made a bit more intersectional and highlight maybe inherent equities, inequities in the effects of climate change that are you know rarely discussed? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that um, science fiction actually has been doing that one way or another for a long time. We have so many scientists today, but also social scientists who were inspired by science fiction shows like Star Trek growing up. And we've seen how a lot of these shows have created this great intersection of science and environmental and ethical issues and also stories of injustice. And I think today, one of our biggest challenges is figuring out how to make those stories relevant again to our current reality. What's think, there was also actually, sorry to see, there was actually an, an article that came out this week in the Harvard Business Review that said that um, science fiction storytelling actually makes kids more resilient. Um, and into there, they sort of form intellectual humility or, and understand how to cope in times like these. And because they're sort of open a lot more to a lot of different issues that they, they're they not just exposed to through regular fiction as well. So. It's fascinating. How do we get those kids to vote is my question. Is there a way we can write a, a movie about that? Because only 19% of them did it in 2016. If you so really I, want them not to vote, make a movie about it. I mean, can, they're so fickle. Well, it's not just that, it's that we also don't have civic engagement has largely gone out of our school systems today. And there's not a culture of participating in voting. In fact, I think it's the opposite. There's this culture of skepticism that your leaders can ever effectively help you. They're all going to be corrupt. And so perhaps science fiction can also be a way to start portraying participation as part of the background of our lives. And you don't have to like hammer it in, but you can just make it part and parcel to our existence. Yeah, I mean, we have to remember that science fiction is a metaphor for a smaller problem. Like it's it's actually easier to convey an issue through either science fiction or pretty much genre in general. And I think that that's where environment, environmental issues have an opportunity is not just to do uh, science fiction, but other genres. And you see it done successfully with some topics and some and not with others. But I do think that keeping that idea of like, this is a metaphor and, exp and exploring that metaphor. And as Bruce said, like digging deeper, like being able, the audience gives you a buy-in, like they, you get one. And if you say, I can build anything in this world, then that's your buy-in. And as a creator, that's your job to say like, in this world, this world that I'm creating, this is the new truth. And I think the, the goal that we have is to infuse it with not just um, doomsday, but hope. Like how do we give these next generations hope that they can change, that there can be a reversal, that we're not you know, destroying the earth and we're gonna have to go to Mars. Like that's, there's that possibility, of course. And, but how do we use that metaphor to tell this story in a way that connects not just to a younger generation, but the older generation who's responsible for a lot of the things that are happening. Because it, it's only been a hundred years since we've had a, a huge um, sort of technological boom. And so how do we how do we reverse what we've done as a human race? That's interesting. And I think also, JC, when you talk about um, sort of like the, the idea of representation, I think that science fiction is hasn't always been great at it on the screen. I think it's been a lot better at it in terms of um, in terms of fiction and, and novels and books, right? And I think it's getting it's getting a lot better now. Star Trek is, I think, is is sometimes is a sadly more of an outlier than uh, than anything else. It hasn't always been as inclusive as it needs to be. But you know, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, Detroit, Michigan. I, as a teenager, I really, you know, fell in love with *Handmaid's Tale*. And my name is Moira. To actually watch the show and have a black Moira that I've never seen before, ever in the history of representation of Moiras, um, was really sort of special to me. And also was a book that I loved. And as a Canadian, was a was a book that was sort of traditionally seen as as very important, you know sort of in terms of our society. So it's, I think it's always the idea of representation changes and shifts because people are much more conscious of it and they're sort of much more open to it. And I think that's being represented more now in science fiction than, than ever before in the things that are actually coming out. And I think that some things that are starting to be on the screen as well. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is getting people to imagine themselves being part of 
not an end goal, but part of a transition. Because a lot of times, as soon as politicians start saying, you know, hey, we're going to cut back on our reliance on fossil fuels, once it becomes a reality, people freak out about it, and they don't see how we can make that transition. I think science fiction can help people to see themselves as part of solutions. But kind of speaking to representation, I think a challenge for science fiction is also uh, being representational of different realities and different starting points and not stereotyping those starting points either. I What I like too is that it's in the hands of great writers rooms and it, it goes all the way up a bottom line and below the line. And I think the writers have a really good opportunity to take <laughs> policy, right Rosalind? And then move it forward. Um, and I, I don't know, how do your writers rooms, Bonnie, you've been in writers rooms, Bruce, you have too. We're going to wrap this up and move on to something else but your writer's room experiences do you take from what you see in the news and bring it to your scripts uh i would say for me i mean a lot of my work up until now hasn't really been kind of connected to a lot of the advocacy work i've done around plastic pollution so these are the first stories now i'm working on that are really bringing those stories together and realizing that allowing myself to do that. A large part of it was just allowing myself to let those two worlds meet and realizing that, you know, the way we consume and shift so many perspectives is through the culture of television and film. And I, you know, I just had to remind myself that this is the best place, however much I can be pushing policy and campaigning, I need to bring it into this world. So it didn't, it just came from my own kind of day-to-day -day personal journey in that. Great. Um, I have yeah. to over to what I think is going to be really helpful for us for our remaining writers rooms and um, the way that we use so much paper or used to use so much paper with all the script printouts and all the rewrites and you know the scripts they lay out at your front door every day before you shoot. Um, you know, writers, we have water bottles everywhere, we have snacks all over the place, we have plastic everywhere and there's so many ways of fixing it, you know what I mean? So we have this video here from Steve from Scriptation and he has a wonderful message for us. Hey, it's Steve from Scriptation. I want to thank Young Entertainment Activists for putting on this incredible event and allowing me to tell you a little bit about how I started my company. Like many of you, I was an assistant working in the entertainment industry and I was on a show where we were printing a 50 page script and making a hundred plus copies every single night. I thought that was an incredible waste of paper and there had to be a better way. So I created an app where you can make notes digitally and transfer those notes into subsequent script revisions. And if you've worked in Hollywood, you know that there is a never ending amount of script revisions. Um, so I did this while I was an assistant at a lower level, and it just shows you that no matter what level you are or where you exist in Hollywood, you can make a change. You don't have to create an app to do it. You can do something as simple as opting out of paper script deliveries or reusing the same coffee cup or any number of things. So thank you for having me. Um, pledge paperless and enjoy the rest of the event. how simple it is. Uh, if you watch the scenes that came in just now, we had Ozark season three, um, American Housewife. Um, we've seen a couple examples of sustainable storytelling, such as reusable shopping bags and the Earth Day and community composting and Jack Ryan biking to work. I mean, he's a, you know, he's a powerhouse and he bicycles to work, you know, it's little things like that. So for the audience listening right now and tuning in, um, I want to give you a chance to try it out for yourself to win a free final draft software package. Um, and using the hashtag HDCS story, I want you to tweet or comment your answer and follow Yeah Impact on Instagram. And, and the Twitter winner will be announced tomorrow at around noon Pacific time. So I want you to take this following scene and add five sustainable elements to it. So uh, the writers out there, the young ones, uh, the old ones, if you don't like the word old, you know, stop getting old. Uh, the following scene is as follows. 
two friends walk into a coffee shop to get a drink and catch up? What sustainable products, brands, and actions would you showcase them using or within the shop? Hashtag HDCS story. I'm going to say it one more time. Take the following scene and add five sustainable elements. Two friends walk into a coffee shop to get a drink and catch up. All right, panelists, I don't want you to cheat and try to uh, make that scene better. We already know how to make it better. Bruce is already writing a, a full movie about that one scene, right, Bruce? You're on mute, but it doesn't really matter. Um, all right, I want to dive in more and learn a little bit more about the planet-saving creatives that you all are. Uh, what are, in your opinion, um, some general solutions to adding storylines of sustainability into storytelling, like things you've implemented or seen in your work? Um, Bruce? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't look at it that way. You know, I, you know, I don't look at it as kind of how to add if, if, you know, if someone in the story is an advocate, they can do advocacy, but the show's not there to do advocacy. Um, you know, the show is exists in our world and they have the same concerns we do. So all of that, but I, you know, I don't really, uh, think about it that way. I think about, you know, what, what our characters would be worrying about more what what the the society of Gilead is worried about, and they're very green, um, and uh, that gives us a lot of opportunity because anytime we can have the terrible people in Gilead doing something that we aspire to and that they've succeeded at and we failed at, it makes me feel uh, ooky in a good way. Yeah, I agree. It makes me feel ooky too. Um, what about you, Bonnie? Um, general solutions and adding stories storylines of sustainability or. Nay. Yeah, I think I would kind of, there's the two different stories. There's the story as you as the filmmaker, and then there's the story obviously of your, um, you know, your protagonist and your world. Um, I think for me, I've become more hyper aware of just how I'm operating my sets. Like I can't be telling this story of, of trying to be more sustainable or lower impact if I'm not doing that as well in my own production. So looking at, looking at that as a challenge and, and setting, um, you know, trying to actually carve out a budget to make sure that I could do that. Um, and then I think, I mean, looking at sustainability is this huge umbrella of a topic. So I think it's really focusing in on what is it exactly um, about being more sustainable. I kind of prefer to say lower impact because to actually truly be sustainable is pretty near impossible. So I would say just lower impact storylines you're trying to focus on and like maybe choosing a specific environment within that large world and trying to just focus on something specific, whether it's oceans, forests, air. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's not just necessarily, uh, it's creating in the world of that, but you you had recently wrapped a script. Uh... Oh wait, I lost the end of your question. Oh, uh, you had just finished a script, correct? Yeah, uh, I just finished writing a script that's called Unearthed that is basically set in a town that is around a chemical plant, a plastic factory, and it talks about sort of the pollution that is that toxically runs off from that. So obviously the community that's affected by that, but it's actually entire, entirely a genre piece that it's the pollution is shown in a, in a monster. Basically, a monster is born out of this land because it is so um, toxic. And so the monster really is an extension of our monstrous behavior and how we're polluting the planet rather than the monster representing earth coming back to kind of hunt us down. It's, we are the monster at the end of the day was the kind of message in that. So I've obviously gone like full force on bringing um, that story into my narrative, uh, which is a new thing for me. Okay, would, um, I can't wait to uh, you know, read the script. Also, can I be the lead? <laughs> the monster? <laughs> Think it over. Yeah, I'll be the monster. <laughs> <laughs> Great casting. Um, question to the rest of you too. Should creators be making bigger waves by dedicating entire pieces of content to discussing uh, lower impact and the environment? Or is it better to just make subliminal changes? Um, what do you think? I think it's a little bit of both actually. And I 100% and I agree with, with Bonnie in terms of, you know, it's one thing to sort of make a, a project about, you know, the environment or about sustainability or about, you know, low impact and then sort of the 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 car you know the, the carbon footprint that you leave making that that movie is you know is completely unsustainable. So I think it's definitely important for us to sort of especially right now I think there's a great opportunity in order to in order to do that. Um, 
So um, I think it's one of those things that we really need to kind of like really focus in on that, um, that as well as really kind of thinking about um, how do you kind of um, look at it from that perspective, but then also, you know, we're working with, um, we're doing two docu-series right now that really kind of focus in on the environment, but really sort of looking at it from a, from a different way. Um, the other piece is also thinking about, um, sorry, there's some distractions around. Her husband has name. But, uh, I know. <laughs> Hello. Uh, but it's also sort of thinking about it from this perspective of, yeah, we have a docu-series and then there's also a, um, a project that we're doing about water that is actually like, that's definitely very important to us, sort of highlighting a woman who is creating a new, um, a new app. Um, around water rights and looking at sort of like and water conservation and also pollution. So I think and we're really focusing on bringing her story forward. So I think there's a couple different ways. I think obviously on the narrative side, there's one thing, but it's also how do you use documentary in a, in a very different way so that it doesn't feel prescriptive, but it actually sort of has some value and um, and entertains and informs at the same at the same time. Because I think sometimes we've seen so many different prescriptive documentaries, but that doesn't actually push people into action. So it's how do you look at these things from a from a different way and present content in a different way yeah. to actually get people engaged. Yeah, and yeah. I want to throw it to Bruce real quick. Be, uh, the audience, you can weigh in too. Um, if you think, you know, should creators be making bigger waves by dedicating entire pieces of content to sustainability or in the environment or is it better to make subliminal changes? We want to hear that uh, on Yeah Impact. So you can go on Twitter and find that out. But Bruce, are you doom and gloom? Is that your vibe? Or are you, or you believe in uh, hopeful storytelling when it comes to sustainability? I know we, we covered it, but I'm curious. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I believe in optimistic or pessimistic storytelling. Um, uh, I, I personally am optimistic, but um, you know, I don't know if, if my characters are, some of them are. Um, uh, I, you know, I think that you know, what I do is, is try to uh, hire people who are kind of news junkies and live very, very much connected to the world and then bring them in and try to have them forget all that and create a new world. But you want them all to be of this world and curious people and consumers of current and uh, original thinking and all of those kinds of things. So I think the best thing that we can do, you know, be, the best thing we can do for a big impact beyond... Uh, all the things that are being done practically on sets and all the things that are being done story-wise is to make sure writers have good information. Make sure oh. writers, that's the best thing is to get writers curious and interested in the stuff you're doing. That's you, Rosalyn. What's up? Sorry to cut you off, Bruce. Um, no, no, I, please. I, I actually just wanted to speak to a point that Bonnie brought up, which, which where you said that, you know, it's impossible to actually be totally sustainable or get there. And I think that that's something that, that we're dealing with right now is it's impossible not to be a hypocrite these days. Like, no matter how much you want to do better, you're always undermining that in some way with some action. And that's largely because of the systems that we live in. We live in this really high consumption society. The economy is all wrong forever conquering climate change or stopping global mass extinctions. And so we have to go beyond sustainability. We have to go towards restoration. And I, I would really like to just throw out a challenge to writers. How can you reflect that in, in the context of the worlds that you're creating? How do you reflect being in these systems and maybe living with figuring out how to get beyond those systems. And it doesn't have to overwhelm your story or make it completely about that, but it can be the background of life because the background of our lives now is that we're dealing with this really slow moving, huge tsunami of a crisis that's coming in towards the shore. Um, and the other thing is on, but if you want to reflect these little changes um, in your stories, it's not just about coffee cups, but it's also kind of you know, like what, what you said, Bruce, tuning into those, you know, the news junkies and being aware of the world and experts. Like we know that SUVs are one of the, the largest rising contributors in terms of personal transportation to CO2. Yet so many shows these days show the reality of like of, of our current lives, which is everyone jumps into an SUV in American society to go get, you know, get the bad guys or whatever that is. Well, how could that be different? And let's be connected to these problems and maybe show things a little differently. Yeah, they have an all hybrid uh, Subaru Outback. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Get the cops at the go. Really to, to, to look at this as an opportunity and not a wait. Like I think one of the one of the things is that you know you don't 
as I think as creators, it's like, oh, well, how do you add this? Like, first of all, I think it, everything has to be done organically. If it doesn't fit in the story, don't force it in because that's never going to work. But I think if you if you look at this as an opportunity to tell an entertaining story and have it be done organically, I think that that's where you really get something that can be great because there are people that have, you know, sort of focused on Roland Emmerich fa famously focuses on like massive, you know, disaster films and deals with this stuff. And it's, you know, you don't even realize it that you are eating vegetables because it's so, you know, you know, it's just like eating a salad that's drowned in blue cheese dressing. Like you can't really tell that there's vegetables underneath. And I think that that's an opportunity. And I think if writers and creators look at, at this space in this world um, as what it is, which is chock full of opportunity because it has been prescriptive, because it has been educational, because it has been discounted as solely vegetables, that you actually have a whole world figuratively and literally to play with. And that's, that's you know, when you look at it as a chance, it's why certain things connect. And that's exciting to me as someone who is, um, you know, choosing what material we, we are exploring. Yeah, rest in peace soup plantation. They were known for piling blue cheese on the salads. Um, I'm curious about uh, legal policy, Rosalind. I, I've, I heard Dorothy mention it, Dorothy, who works with you, Bruce, mention it earlier. Um, you know, I wanna, I wanna see a show that teaches people about legal policy in a way that is interesting and exciting and dangerous. Something where they walk away and they're like, I wanna vote on this policy. Cause at the end, that's what's holding us back. Is that right, Rosalind? Well, yeah, um, voter participation is actually incredibly low. And I think that goes back to my point about people don't necessarily see it these days as a way to make real change. And yet the fact of the matter is, is that the more you're talking to decision makers and the more they're hearing from people, it really is true that the more likely they are to go your direction. But there is there's so much drama there. There's the drama of um, special interests, of big companies that are that are pushing for the way they want to go. There's the drama of building partnerships, getting other people to, to see issues the way you're seeing them. And I mean, in the, there's kind of a, I would say there's a little, sometimes there's a little bit of a rift these days between the conservation community in California, for example, and people in, in cities in very polluted areas who are working on environmental justice issues. So you've got like the wildlife people and the, and the justice people. And so there are opportunities for stories about how are we gonna get these people to see that, you know, that it's so important that they have these issues in common and that they can come together and then they can work with policymakers to make change. And I just wanna throw out that right now, California is looking at, at cutting all these funds from our environmental budget. And this is exactly the wrong time to do that because this is exactly the opportunity right now uh, with COVID-19 and all of our economic losses to really look at an environmentally driven recovery. And I think that there are so many stories there and ways for Hollywood to help be part of that story of pushing for a better future. Yeah, I smell a rom-com between the <laughs> Why not? It would be great. Um, I want to uh, just pause for a second, and, and um, we have a video from another one of our amazing sustainable partners, and, and Earth Angels, thank you so much for being a part of this. So I just want the audience to see what they're up to. There really isn't a managed approach right now in the United States in, in terms of monitoring a production's environmental impact. The information is out there, but there isn't any follow through. And that's where Earth Angel comes in. The way we do this, uh, we've created our own department. So we're the eco department. So Earth Angel provides the strategy, the staff, the stuff, and the stats to help shows shoot sustainably. We actually recruit, train, and supervise eco production assistants on every show we work on. So there's always a dedicated individual who is overseeing and maintaining a show's sustainability effort. Eliminating plastic water bottles, the cost that's saved from that alone can end up paying for the cost of the eco PA, who also goes on to save the production in many other ways. And the level of environmental impact assessment reporting that we provide is pretty tremendous um, in terms of here's how many plastic water bottles you avoided, all the way up into here's your carbon footprint. 
um, and really digesting that, breaking it down into ways that are digestible for cast and crew to understand. It's exciting to be part of things that are necessary. This work will define our lives. It will be our legacy. talk about sustainable filmmaking, we're inevitably talking about sustainable transportation, sustainable fashion, sustainable food service. We have to have a knowledge of all of these different industries and as a consultant I have to be able to interface with all these departments and offer them realistic solutions that can work within a production timeline. A lot of productions, if they don't have a sustainability campaign, it would then be left up to um, the production staff. And the unfortunate reality is that environmentalism is, is not the priority. We are essentially a traveling circus, and especially in New York City, we do a lot of on-location shooting. Um, it's logistically complicated, so it only makes sense that we would now have a specialized position that is there to monitor the environmental impact and there to help reduce it and help educate people and help the industry evolve into this sustainable model, into the future of filmmaking. That's great. That's what Earth Angels is about. They go in and they help productions, uh, you know, meet that sustainable bottom line. And, you know, if they didn't start it, who would? And I've, there's other friends around the world, too. In the UK, they're doing it uh, for the crown. They're creating sustainable sets, um, you know, lower impact sets. And I just think that's fantastic. So Earth Angels, thank you uh, once again for being one of our partners. Um, I want to throw this question out to Moira and Adriana and Rosalind. How, how about these development executives and producers, how can they save money on environmental sustainability ideas? And do you have any advice to writers about maybe how to pitch to producers or executives so those changes do get made? When you say when you say save money, what do you what do you mean exactly in terms of like the so for maybe for sets if you think about sets or maybe um, like if a, a scene in Jack Ryan has a helicopter and uh, you know that you use some diesel fuel versus uh, a, a hybrid I made up a hybrid helicopter but like is there any advice you can give to young writers producers directors coming up that is there a tactic that could be used in, that's beneficial to them. Well, I mean, I think it's a lot of it has to do with just sort of having the opening the conversation. You know, I think it's one thing when you're when you're pitching, you're, you you might not sort of get down into the sort of like the sort of nitty gritty of, of sustainability on set. But, you know, once the project starts to come together, you can really sort of bring that up more on the production side. Right. With the with physical production as well. It, it's I think it's a those are the, the development piece and then the, the production piece are definitely going to be kind of two conversations, but I think it's a conversation that people can start having at the at the beginning once they know that the project is sort of kind of going with, you know, on the production side, you know, you're, when you're thinking about, okay, well, we want to be able to, to um, think about what our production design actually looks like, you know, when, you know, when we're, when we're looking at, you know, the different cars or the different, you know, sort of looks on set and maybe sort of have that kind of, you know, sustainable feel to it or, do you know what I mean? I think it's it's a little bit different than on the on the straight development side, but but more on the actual physical production. That's just my experience. In it, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of development or pitching, I think you do it like you do everything else, and 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 not making it an outlier. Actually, just making it feel like it's part of the conversation. And I think what is interesting is having it be different. Like one of the ideas that we're exploring is a positive well, like it's it's more in the vein of like Moana which took the sort of idea of you have this world that's being disrupted because you took something from it and now you have a heroine who's going into the you know trying to put it back and trying to make it right and so I think it's more it's it's, it's just like everything else it's just focusing on the environment and 
if you want to challenge, Leonardo DiCaprio is always looking for environmental stuff. Like it's what he's looking for. So if you want to write something for him, like, you know, that should be the barometer. Like it, it's, it's sort of, um, I think Bonnie said it earlier, where she said, I allowed myself to work on this. And I think that that's, that's it. Allow yourself to work on it. Um, you know, I think it's, you see it in, already in shows and in films. And it's just a question of like making sure that it, it's done organically. And that if you are pitching an environmental movie that you're conscious of, you know, those things or that you creatively figure out how do you solve that solution? How do you solve something without it being uh, a magical thing comes from the sky? Mm. Um, but I always like different. Like if you're going to give me something like it's this is normally done in horror, let's do it in comedy. If this is normally done in comedy, let's do it in horror. Like it's it's science. This is normally done in science fiction, which as we talked about, it's a great genre for this. But how do we right now in this world in this moment? How do we, you know, give people more hope? And I think it's not having a burden, not having to carry it and want and wanting people to want to experience it. So in terms of pitching or development, I feel like it's just like everything else. I don't know if, yeah. Bruce, do you have any thoughts on the writer's room element of it? Uh, in what capacity? You know, uh, the best way to approach maybe making changes or servicing these ideas in, in the writer's room. You know, if people are pitching ideas to you, what are you, you're going to lean towards the most organic, but is there is there some kind of thing that you're looking for, obviously, if it fits the character? Uh, not in the not in the writer's room. I, th I think overall efficiency is what is what we're always talking about, and so little of that comes out of the storytelling. The difference between a scene with ten people and twenty people is minuscule compared uh, to the gas we burn in a day. So I think that making real changes, and you know, and luckily technology is is helping us by leaps and bounds. Um, just uh, you know, just drones and post production has saved us so many gallons of gasoline because post-production is all, you know, we're not, we used to fly prints to New York every night to get them processed with, as film. That's every single night there were people flying over and that doesn't happen anymore. So all of the um, efficiencies that we're getting kind of on the bigger scale are, are how you sell this to the, to networks who are always trying to save money. It's just by saying it's a, it's a money saver. And writers pitching ideas, you'd say it's just some money. You maybe go from the economic point of view. I don't pitch ideas based on this hey, ever. I wanted to <laughs> out there for the people listening, just in case. Um, well, we're we're coming up uh, with about fifteen minutes or so left on this, um, and I want to just check in with you all. Or hopefully, you're having a good time. If you have any input or thoughts uh, on something that you're working on or what you're inspired by, by all means. And audience, uh, if you're out there and you're still with us, thank you for hanging in there. This is great. Um, I'm. I, we had talked about policy, but what kind of you know storytelling let's see from why is storytelling important to sustainability and making changes why why that route um i know that's because that's our job but why is it important uh, well, I, I, anyone. Oh, oh i was just going to say i think it's what adriana said it's, it's you hide your vegetables you know um that's why it's important for kind of getting any piece of information across you know entertainment's a really a uh, good way to do it um that's why you know, I'm so resistant to putting anything in it that isn't based in that, you know, made that decision because people get really turned off really quickly. But I think that's, Adriana had the answer. Okay, what about you, Bonnie? You, um... Yeah, I was just gonna say that obviously, I mean, the climate crisis that we're so in the midst of is at the front of, you know, so many agendas of people's concerns, um, fears, worries, you know, and we are at and in a space of culture where you can bring that story in so it's inclusive and it's accessible. People know how to consume film and TV very well. We do it all the time, if not more right now. Whereas I find, you know, you can speak on other platforms that are inherently from an environmental space, whether that's the work I do with Greenpeace, you know, that is a less accessible environment a lot of the time because many huge parts of population feel kind of excluded from that dialogue, which is we hope changing, but TV and film has such a powerful space to make it accessible and use language and ideas and entertainment to like subconsciously take us on that story. And I think talking about technology, I think what would be 
awesome. What I would love to do is when you leave a film, is there a number to text that you get sent, you know, who to call at Congress or a policy to sign? Like, how do you use technology as a platform so you don't just leave the film transforming that person's mind, but like actually we take action because most people really want to take action. They just don't know where to start. And like, we can inspire people, but it would be cool if you could have like a really good engaging place once you leave the theater or your living room to like do something. Yeah, that we actually have a team. My company actually has a team that is builds in what are called impact campaigns. And so we're looking at exactly that. Like, how do you take action? Like if someone's seeing something or consuming some, a piece of entertainment and then you give them something else to do, because I think if the onus is on us to have the conversations of the stuff that's already being done. And it's also not shaming people for doing certain things, but hopefully, you know, leading them towards a different way of, of looking at it. And if it's, you know, I think the difference when I was going to New York before this was like, making sure that I said, no, I don't need a bag because it's, I'm so used to California. They just don't give you bags. Um, this before pre COVID obviously, but, um, I, it's, it's, that's exactly what our impact team is doing is sort of building these opportunities for people to be able to put that action somewhere. Um, cause I do think that it's, it is important to, to have that. Moira, what were you saying? I was gonna say, I think even when it comes to the storytelling though, I think there's there's so many different ways to kind of explore this. You know, Aaron Brockovich is a really great movie about the environment, right? And I think it shifted and opened a lot of people's minds to the issues. And uh, when I was back home a, a couple of months ago in Detroit, there was a there was a chemical spill and the entire time they kept referencing uh, Aaron Brockovich in the news reports. And it was something that people actually connected to because it was such a profound movie for so many people. And they understood what that meant. When they heard Aaron Brockovich, they knew that was not a good thing, right? Um, and so I think there's a way to definitely, I think you can definitely hide things, but I think it's also like, how do we create, you know, storylines and films if that's, if it's specifically about, um, you know, the environment or the environmental impact, you know, that that actually have, um, that are sustainable, right? That, that people really kind of remember and that are iconic and that kind of really put an imprint on people's brains and then think about what is the, you know, what's the action step after. I don't always think it has to be something that's sort of overly hopeful or overly positive, but I think I agree that the action step is really, really important because these things are imprinted on people's brains in terms of, you know, in terms of their importance, right? So, and they're and important in our lives. I think also that, that through storytelling, we have the opportunity to make it normal to think in terms of connections. So right now, I mean, we should normalize uh, thinking about the environment anyway, but one of the biggest issues we have is people don't make connections between issues. So, you know, uh, what are the connections between concentration camps on the U.S.-Mexico border and climate change? Well, that's massive weather disruptions in Central America is a big part of that leading to crop failure. And what are the connections between uh, food prices going up. What are what are all of these connections? It's it can be very hard to think in terms of all of these complex issues and how all these things go together. But I think there are ways that we can start making it normal, more normal and easier to to say, oh yeah, you know, this is because of this, or um, and and not just have very very simple and straightforward stories, but also. Um, have people start to to link things in storytelling? That'd be exciting. I like I like you know I, composting uh, and methane. I didn't realize uh, all that could be prevented if I just started to you know stop throw my banana peels at my family members and just put it in the compost. Changes yeah. things. Um, Rosal, question from the uh, an audience member. Stacey, you're frozen. Oh no, it happened. Yeah, what was that my, question? My... Okay, you can hear me now? Yeah. This is my nightmare. The freezing is my nightmare. You guys are my dream. All right, ready? The question from the audience. It's from Daniel Reynolds. Reynolds. How can we shift the convo from consumer behavior towards changing larger corporate systems in our narratives? Mm. 
Is that, is that for? Oh, that's for you, Rosalind. Oh, okay. Um, that's a, a, a really great question. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've seen some, I, I kind of geek out on these really light, simple superhero stories like The Flash and stuff like that. And um, uh, I don't know, I was a big Wonder Woman fan when I was a kid and that just never went away. Um, but one thing that they tend to do is they're like, you know, they're going up the, against the big corporation or, or the people with all the power. And um, I think you can kind of take that storytelling out of kind of this, the, this super generalized superhero world and take it into other kinds of stories, um, but make it less about like the little guy going up against the big guy and more about people starting to talk about, um, I don't know, you could have a conversation. Why do you recycle? All right, well, there's so much shame around recycling, right? Did you put it in the right bin or whatever? Um, but we know for a fact that recycling is not doing a lot of good these days. And they're planning to build more plastic plants across the United States right now, which is in turn helping the fracking industry, the natural gas industry in the US, which in turn releases all this methane into the atmosphere. So this is a big corporate issue. And actually this idea that recycling, that we can save ourselves with recycling is actually a corporate pushed idea that governments adopted when they were looking for solutions. But originally governments actually tried to fight waste decades ago and got pushed back in lawsuits from corporations. So I think that we can start to have these conversations and storytelling and perhaps create stories where this is more the, the background of what's going on and, and uh, make it more normal to think in terms of, you know, who should be taking responsibility for these issues that we're worried about. Where does that lie? Does that lie with me? Or am I holding others accountable who have uh, concentrated a lot of wealth and power in our society? Oh, hot damn, Rosalind came with it. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Perfect, I feel like I'm a teacher. Am I a teacher? Okay, I guess I'm teaching you all in this moment of Zoom. Um, I'm curious now because we're gonna wrap up on time. Uh, each of you, I'm sure, has some wonderful advice. Do you have any words of advice to young creators wanting to make a difference, um, especially in this time of quarantine when sets are going to be very different and the way we communicate is different? Um, let's start with Moira. Oh, um, <laughs> I think it's one of those things where it's open. I think I think it's finding your number one, finding your community, and I'm going to be very basic, right? So I think it's finding your community because I think a lot of times. This is gonna be, it's such a different time right now that um, making change on your own is always difficult, right? But if you sort of find your community and you, and you understand how to sort of create change together and actually create action steps together, I think that's actually really important right now. I think that's the one thing that we can do, especially in this time where we're all sort of communicating over Zoom and we're having a bunch of meetings, you know, and we're sort of talking about things. Like, I think that the one the one big thing to do is sort of create an, an action plan together, you know, and not feel like you're all by yourself trying to trudge and make and make any kind of change on your own. I think it's always that always feels difficult. It always feels sort of um, all encompassing. It always feels like you're, you know, there's such a, a ladder that you have to climb. But I think if you find a community and you find your community that where you're sort of actually working together, I think that's sort of like the one thing that we can do right now is to find that community to actually make change and make change together. Oh, good advice. Anybody else got some advice for young creators? Uh, yeah, I would say um, if you want to make a difference, I think it's like I was saying before, it's like getting a bit more specific on what that difference is, whether or not it's kind of a, a, a topic, a specific topic, whether or not that is methane produced in landfills because, you know, there's not oxygen in there to decompose everything is that's your issue. Maybe go to um, small uh, nonprofits that really focus on that and ask them, like, what is the story you're trying to tell with your nonprofit advocacy and policy work and how can I best incorporate that into my narrative storytelling because I think we can all assume what the story is that needs to be told but maybe go and ask and have a conversation with other people and say what how can I help to tell the story you're trying to tell and have been for a long time and I would say in terms of our time in quarantine I would really use these limitations as a helpful uh, thing because I think 
trying to, you know, it's so, there's so much choice to be made the minute you start with a blank piece of paper of a story or you're trying to film something. So maybe use these limitations as a way to kind of push your ideas through and, and, um, and use it as a, a positive. Um, and I think it's just a reminder that everyone can do it. We do all have computers, smartphones, all these things that we can do things on. So maybe like now's, you're out of excuses to kind of get inspired and get on. My advice is be curious. Like if you're a curious person, you like just read stuff, go into rabbit holes, um, come out of them with a new story. Like just be curious, be curious about the environment, be curious about the world, be curious about everything that you're exploring and, and come back with the wealth of information. Um, because I think the more you know, the more you know. And so, and, 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 and you have to live with something for years, like whether it's an idea and if you're bored of it, trust me, the reader will read that. And sometimes I'll read a script and it'll be like, and, and the character was bored. And I was like, yeah, so am I, you know, like it, it indicates to you where you are. So if your curiosity is there at the forefront and you are still interested in these characters years later, um, that's telling you something. So uh, that would be my advice, be curious. Wonderful, any final thoughts, anyone? Um, I would just say uh, the, the key is that whatever you think of, everybody in the world doesn't agree with you and everybody in the world doesn't disagree with you, but there are some people who disagree with you and there are some people who agree with you. So find someone who you disagree with, who you can talk to, who you can figure out, because that's the character you're gonna have to write. The one who agrees with you is easy. Find someone who you can talk to, who you respect, who has a good heart, who can explain to you why they think what they think. Because otherwise you'll never understand it. Oh, I loved that advice. That's so wonderful. And you know, Adriana, Bruce, uh, Bonnie, myself, everyone that's involved um, in this summit. What a great idea. Um, and I just can't thank you enough. And good luck to all the writers and creators out there. And you can still go on and comment with your stories at hashtag HDCS story on Facebook. Thank you all so very much. I appreciate your time and you stay safe and stay healthy. And here's a video from Ali coming up. Hi everyone. Welcome to my living room. <laughs> I'm Allie Weinstein and I'm the producer of the Sustainable Storytelling Workshop. So obviously we have been excited to share with you a day of ideally world changing and industry changing content, but we wanted to make sure that we also provide you with some resources so that you can go out and make those changes yourself. Um, we're excited to have paired with some sustainable companies who are willing to collaborate with creatives like you on your scripts, on your TV shows, on your films, on your documentaries, whatever creative content you feel like you might need some sustainable advice on or are potentially looking to use their products. Um, so we are gonna provide via email a list of those companies and all their contact information so that you can utilize them as you need to after the summit. We also wanted to use this panel as a jumping off point for a new program that we're in the beginning stages of developing called Climate Ambassadors. We know that you're all probably here because you're interested in implementing these changes directly in your offices or on your sets, which obviously when we get back to them, um, but maybe you're not sure how to go about it and you need some more help. So we want to cultivate a community of ambassadors who are committed to implementing those changes in their work and their personal lives with companies like Scriptation and Earth Angel, which you got to check out little videos from in the panel. Um, we wanna provide our ambassadors with resources so that we can all work towards a more climate friendly environment. If you're interested in becoming a climate ambassador and making our industry, our culture, our stories, our world more green, please keep an eye out for an email with more information to sign up. Thanks. One of the speakers from XRLA said, what we do is nonviolent direct action. We're looking for people who don't mind being arrested. And I thought, ah, that's the group for me. I saw there was an action at Universal Studios a while back, back in April uh, 2019, I believe. We got helicopters, we got a lot of mass media on that one. That was a very powerful, very brave, heroic action in our early days with relatively few of us, with just the idea that we cooked up in somebody's garage and then we went out and did it. I saw Extinction Rebellion as the only organization 
with people of privilege like myself that was willing to make people uncomfortable, including people like myself, because direct action is not comfortable, uh, but neither is climate change. Direct action is showing up physically, physically and creatively. It is an offense in both meanings of the word. It's an offensive strategy and it is offensive and it's meant to be. And you're going to go do something disruptive. You're going to take risks to do it. You put your body on the line and you take some kind of direct action to stop injustice and try to make the world a slightly better place. I think we've all become very accustomed to collectivism and petition signing. It's different when you show up as a human in a space with other humans in that space. When we look throughout history, we see that a lot of changes that were made were from ordinary people who decided to rise up and demand change. You will find so many examples of huge changes that have come about. Funnily enough, not by politicians and governments leading the change because so often they're the last ones to get behind it. I grew up learning in history class about the civil rights movement and how powerful that was. And when we look at the number of people participating, we don't need 100% actively participating or even 50%. It's really a small number of people in the scheme of things who can create massive change. Direct action means to me, no fear and challenging someone's thinking to evolve and to change the situation. Just look back, apartheid in South Africa fell, civil rights under Martin Luther King. There's so many examples, the union struggles, the history of humanity in a way is the history of direct action. So when we're planning actions with XR, you know, we usually start from a point of what's our goal? You know, what would we like to see happen? Why are we doing this action? The larger group is composed of smaller working groups. There's a lot going on which is important and which is a lot of fun. So we meet, we get together, and our tactical group will form a like a street plan of exactly where we're going to be performing the action, and our arts team will then come together and come up with an arts component for that. All of the parts that it takes to get to a really vibrant and beautiful direct action experience takes so much back work and so much support from so many people. You have the artists who are going and creating these beautiful objects or costumes. So you have the people who are doing outreach and making sure that people know. You have people who are creating the short videos. There's just so many different roles. You know, you escalate your actions according to what works and what doesn't. If you see that the initial actions don't work, you escalate and you take it up enough. So in January and February of this year, we started launching a campaign against Chase Bank. Chase Bank is the number one funder of fossil fuel companies in the world. The way that we executed um, the actions at the banks um, was very, very fulfilling and fun. We invoked our indigenous federal rights to pray, proclaimed and affirmed in 1978 by American Indian movements. We charge J.P. Morgan Chase with the crimes of genocide, ecocide, and femicide. We must divest now. We were building a snake, this 20-foot long snake that was going to be dancing around the Chase Bank representing the oil pipelines. We must end the criminal financing against humanity and against Earth Mother and all of our relatives. We must divest now. Divest now! Now. We get uh, different stand, um, standards by who are wondering why, this, why is there a big gathering of people with instruments and banners and gadgets and everything in the parking lot and then you start to approach those people and you start to, to do some, some outreaching and some people spontaneously actually join in. It's hard to describe an XR action. An XR action is like all of the, all of the emotions that you have about climate and climate change coming into like a physical manifestation of the Red Brigade and all of these banners and the boat and everything else that we bring out that is not just symbolic, but like really, I think, speaks to our, our rage, our pain, our hope, but also the rage and pain of hope.
and the hope of um, everyone else. We need to be disruptive. We need to draw attention to this crisis. What does it better than a pink boat and 11 people blocking a street? The day before the Oscar Awards, we were protesting at the Hollywood sign because we were demanding that Hollywood wake up to the climate emergency. We staged a whole protest and march at Synchronized Dying. We were planning that for um, a month or so. Everyone was just doing everything. We were always trying to chip in in any way possible. We had a Red Rebel Brigade. That was the first youth Red Rebel Brigade. And we had Sonia Guajajara, who's the Amazonian leader who joined us. Hollywood has a huge global platform. And if it uses its platform for good, then this will create the societal change that we need. Our first demand is for Hollywood to wake up. We need you to understand the climate crisis and acknowledge that we need to take action immediately. Nós indígenas, estamos... It's important to know that indigenous peoples are doing all we can to defend life, to defend democracy, to defend the earth. As we are taking this leadership, we are inviting all of you to band together for this fight for our mother earth. When I joined up, in last June. I knew I needed to do something just to live with myself, but I didn't realize that it was going to be so rewarding and empowering. The juxtaposition of the lonely car ride to arriving to see the rest of XRLA is an enormous sort of leap for your spirits. Here I go, leaving my family to go do a thing because I'm terribly worried about the future and then arriving at the action and hearing the voices of so many other people and seeing a lot of people who are excited to, to voice their concerns and excited to do it in a joint effort, to do it as a group, to amplify. We live in dark times. We live in very dark times. It can be hard to find hope. When I joined Extinction Rebellion, I just found a sense of purpose in my life, that I was part of this gigantic group of people who are fighting for the exact same things that I'm fighting for, a more just and equitable world. But there is hope, and that hope comes from good people joining together and having those beginning conversations. I used to think of activists in separate categories, activists who fight for women's rights, activists who fight for animal rights, activists who fight for social justice. And once I joined the climate movement, I realized that all activists were fighting for very similar things and it's all related to the climate emergency. So this is an invitation to a community circle and to basically rise to your day in a new and renewed culture that you get to imagine and create with so many others of like mind, however, of many different strengths and many different talents. If you want to take action, if you just want to show solidarity, if you want to create, if you want to converse, learn, find comfort, it, all of those things are here. Joining a community, joining an activist community like Extinction Rebellion will help you feel less alone, will help you feel empowered in a way you've never felt empowered before, will help you see the, the strength that you have and the skills that you have that you can bring. We are eager to welcome people. There's lots of important work to do. You will find it satisfying, you will meet some amazing people, and you're going to have lots of opportunities for interesting adventures. It's like uh, if you ever had a really good after school club, <laughs> but this time you're actually doing it for, for a greater cause. And there are dogs. <laughs> every single person is needed and every person is valued in the climate movement. We all have different strengths and those strengths are beautiful when put together. Like real talk, if you don't, if we all don't do this, um, we're going to fail. So we need you.
According to research, 70% of adults spend almost three to five hours per day online. 80% of those hours logged are on a mobile device. We want to psychologically figure out how to manipulate you as fast as possible and then give you back that dopamine. Hit. They own our data, and they own our eyeballs, and they own our attention span, and increasingly our brand preferences. You and I are the good being sold. It's also why they've eviscerated so many privacy standards, getting consumers to give up their personal private information. We have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. Graphics powered by Hovercast. Streaming powered by Wirecast.